So yes, I'm Elke Govertson, and I didn't really, I think like a lot of us didn't really know what I was getting into coming to Hatch, and have sort of rewritten my speech about 35 times in my head during the course of the last three days. So you're going to get a little bit of a mashup. Um, and I'll apologize in advance if I go really fast through the first part, which was the part I thought I was going to talk about, to get to the part I really want to talk about. Um, I also apologize in advance if I swear, because it just happens all of the time. Um, it's because I grew up in like a harbor. Um, really, I did. All right, so are we up? OK. So my talk is, is called the, the Very Model of a Modern Major Media. And before anyone gets excited that I'm going to tell them how to do major media, um, it's actually a little bit more of a riff on the Pirates of Penzance and the model of a modern major general and the idea of content that from 1879 that we still all relate to. And the idea for me of models in media is that anymore it's really not about the platform. You need to build content and a brand that can kind of be above that. Because I don't know what the platform is going to be a year from now. And if I build to today, I'm screwed. So there you go. That's the model. I'm going to skip right through it. Sticky content, know your audience. And the platform is secondary. I started Mamalode um, in Missoula with really the shittiest business model there is. Oh, look, I already swore. OK. Um, <laughs> The ice is broken. OK. Um, I started it as a free local print pro product in 2009, right, right when print media is dying. And then it was going to be free. And then it was going to be supported with like Montessori school ads. Um, so fortunately, it, within my small vision, I also started it with very little money. I started with $400. And that was all I could kind of muster out of our life to do this kind of wing nut thing. And so I printed a rate card, and not very many of them. And I took them around and sold something that didn't exist till I had enough money to make it exist. But I was like stingy with my rate card. If people didn't look like they were going to buy, I was like, can I, can I have that back? Um, <laughs> I only have like a few hundred of them. Um, but I think that going from that small business model, we were able to really sort of have a Petri dish and figure out what worked and what stuck very quickly our readers started spreading us around. So now, just a little over three years later, we actually have paid subscribers to our local free product in all 50 states and 10 other countries. And our writers are from all over the world. And our writers now have really become a lot of the world's biggest mom bloggers, which if you don't like know mom bloggers, they're this wildly powerful group of women that sit at home and like, subvert all of the advertising you guys are doing in their pajamas by saying, I hate my Maytag. Um, it's, it's a true story, actually. There was a woman who hated her Maytag, and she talked about it. Her name's Heather Armstrong. And she got bad customer service, and she spoke about it. And she's also known online as Deuce. And she has, I think, you know, two or three million Twitter followers. And she's like, Maytag sucks. They're so mean. And it became this wild fire they had to put out. And they sent her all of these products. And she's like, I don't want Maytag products. So she gave them all to her homeless shelter down the street. Um, it, and it was a nightmare for them. And so anyway, I took my $400. And now I have this content that talks to, we sort of are trying to take the new media of bloggers and intersect that with traditional advertising. Because these brands do want to work with these women. It's, it's wildly powerful, but it's super scary. Because they're like, sure, let me cover that with my McDonald ads, and maybe tomorrow you'll go on some horrible tirade and say something terrible. And so we come in, and we're sort of curating that. We're giving the traditional advertisers a little bit more of a product, curated, designed, edited. Um, but what we're doing is we're doing it with the most powerful demographic, basically, in the world. It's the sweet spot, really, for most companies. And if you think it's not for the companies that you work with, you're probably wrong. Um, and these slides will show it to you, but I, again, want to get to the part I really want to talk about. Anyway, moms control 85% of household spending. And this generation of moms is increasingly purchasing for their children and their aging parents. So we're going to kind of go quickly through these, but it's like, you know, 91% of new homes and things like that. So what I do 
If you want to talk about the purchasing power of women, I'm happy to talk about that all day, but not in my 20 minutes right now. Um, we've tried to kind of, there's still something about print. And for us, what's really about print is that's how we get these huge writers. It's, it's sort of the opposite. We are not the platform anymore. They kind of are. And so we're catering to them by still having a local print product, and they're psyched, and they read it, and they give it to their mothers, even though they get hundreds of thousands of people to their sites every day before breakfast. Um, we take our print product, and we just adapt each one around a theme so that they're evergreen. We're not like spring 2012. It's, it's theme-based. So as people discover us, they can go back and buy back issues. They can say, I want, to be, I want the identity. I want home, enough. Humor, balance. Um, balance is our new issue. It actually just came out in Missoula yesterday. So if you want it, you're going to have to buy it because I couldn't get them here. And then we also have a website. Right when we first launched, we actually launched thinking we were going to have a brochure website. Um, just sort of nostalgic and darling and cute to even think of anymore. Um, what we've done with our website, though, is we started at one point putting all of our content on the way a lot of media is right now. And that wasn't really working. I mean, the platforms really are different. We really have to just hold on to that idea of being content and a brand that can translate. But the platforms are different enough that we were finding with who we were talking to, they were really busy, and they wanted to connect with each other. And the best way for us to do that was to give them one thing. So now with our website, we actually just give them one thing every day. And they can connect with each other because they're all reading the same thing. Um, and we're moving on to iPad. We're taking our back issues, stripping local ads out. Moving on to iPad, we have some great national partners. Um, we also invented a holiday along the way. The whole thing started with a party the night before Mother's Day. And I called it Mother's Day Eve. And because I'm a nerd, I like trademarked it. Um, <laughs> and then last year, we had a bidding war of people who wanted to license our trademark for Mother's Day Eve. So look for it. If there's a big Mother's Day Eve this year, um, it's like, who gets to invent the holiday, right? You know, that's like Hallmark and Oprah. Um, so, so we do have some, some intellectual property as well. All of that is great, and that was what I was going to talk about for 20 minutes, is marketing to moms and media and print versus digital. But Hatch has been a really interesting thing for me because... I think for um, entrepreneurs or the innovators, um, whatever we're calling ourselves, it's a very, you really have to strike a balance between your left and right brain kind of all of the time. If you, if you tip too far one way or the, another, you're a hobbyist artist who paints and it doesn't go anywhere, or you're you know, kind of a soulless machine that makes tons of money. Um, and somewhere in the middle, there's the rest of us who are soulful people who hopefully make tons of money. And I'm okay with that. The whole idea of selling out that conversation, like, I think that's sort of weird. Um, but that's a whole other 20 minute discussion. I think it's okay to want to do well and get paid for what you love to do. But that's just me. You can string me up later. Um, But this idea of Hatch and this left brain, right brain thing, I've been really left brain with my business for the last few months because we're growing and we're changing and there's these spaces that have been created for us with um, large media um, called us America's Best Parenting Magazine. It was a CEO of a network of blogs that has 40 million views, um, uniques every month called us America's Best Parenting Magazine, and we were like, oh, shit, we better become that. Um, we were like, step into this space created for us. So it's been very strategy and funding and equity and all of those things, and coming to Hatch has been just such a treat to kind of, oh, yeah, like I need to you know, bring that back in, bring that sort of creative process and that part back into the conversation. And so I think for me, Hatch is just more personal than most of the things that I speak at, in part because we all got to go like, to, like people camp 
and spend time with each other beforehand and like brush our teeth together and ride on a school bus and things like that. So I kind of actually wanted to go in a little bit to the context of not just what I do, the power of media, blah, 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 but why I do it. So we're going to go, I don't know if you can see that, elsewhere. Um, elsewhere, this is actually a photograph of mine of the outhouse door, uh, which I grew up with. We called it elsewhere. That was like our little, like, I'm going elsewhere. Um, <laughs> like other families go number two. We went elsewhere. Um, I was born in Missoula, and when I was nine, I moved to Alaska to a very, um, very poor part of Alaska. We actually didn't really have a town. We had to take a school boat to another island to go to school, which sucked in the 80s when you like do your hair. Um, and then you had to ride in a rainy boat. <laughs> and we didn't have power or running water. So my stepfather, a very in ingenious man, figured out how to put like a butane, but not like the little ones that they would make because we didn't go to town very often. So we had like the big butane thing attached to our curling irons. It was incredible. Um, I know, well, I mean, like what a waste of time too. So anyway, now that we're elsewhere, when we moved to Alaska, we were just super poor. And it was very much kind of a subsistence lifestyle. And I, Tim's, are you here? I don't know, Tim. Hi. His comment the other day about sort of the place of privilege where we are, where we get to talk about like making the world better. Um, I think there's, there was something to that. So that kind of got me thinking about this, about my outhouse. And um, <laughs> there's a lot of ways you could go with how you make the world better in an outhouse. But um, that idea of maybe really, not to like bring us all down from our high, um, maybe really the true, true, like pure innovators are the people who are kind of just surviving. And that we're sort of like the lucky innovators who get to be like the second tier innovators who get to think beyond that. So anyway, I grew up super poor in this cabin right there. Um, and this cabin picture is actually a little more recent. So it wasn't like shiny when I lived there, but it was a little bit better than this, but not much. Um, the thing that's falling down on the side was actually a conveyor belt we used to bring coal and wood up from the beach when we'd turn on the generator and it was all cockamamie. Um, but growing up in an environment like this could have really gone one of two ways. It either shapes you to be like very self-reliant and innovative or it shapes you to think that there are limits all around you. Um, we eventually got power, uh, which was very exciting. Uh, we still lived where we lived, so we would come visit my dad in Missoula in the summer, and we would like record MTV, and then we would take it back, and we would watch it. But it was like the same, you know, seven vi videos forever. So that my my references of pop culture are very specific for that time. Like I can sing all of like "Hungry Like a Wolf," and the rest is just <laughs> done. Um, I started my first business at 16. I uh, welded hot tub stoves, called it hot water, because naming things is like my special superpower. Um, but I think that there is something to that, and, and I'll loop back to that with the map kids in just a second. The other little contextual piece I wanted to talk about in this sort of microphone therapy you guys are getting of, oh, I get to talk about why I am this way, um, is this concept of borrowed time. So when I was 25, I wanted to go on an adventure. I don't know if the adventure guys are here or if they're like so tired from their adventures last night. Um, they've, they've decided to motorcycle across like Bridge or Ridge and they'll be back later. Um, and I think that there is something about that idea of adventure tied in with that idea of privilege as well. And that for the big wave surfers, 
were you all here yesterday when they're talking about the big wave servers? There are some of us that those big waves just came to. We didn't have to go find them. Um, so I thought I was on an adventure, thought I was helping people, and I actually came back from that adventure with an unbelievable case of typhoid. And it ruptured my gallbladder, and I was a total mess, and incredibly sick. I flatlined twice, and the white light, the whole thing, it's true. Um, I, I don't know if it's really true, but I think it's where we go because we're like trained to think it. But so I, at 25, I was incredibly sick. I checked out of the hospital at 79 pounds, and which is, was not ideal um, in a lot of ways. But I had gotten cut open from my gallbladder rupturing from breastbone to pubic bone, and I couldn't heal for like six months because we couldn't actually get rid of the typhoid for a really long time. So I was on antibiotics forever, but I had this open wound for ages. And so there is something about that idea of your sort of borrowed time starting when you're really young um, as far as the context of doing business and adventure and perceived risks. You're kind of like, eh. it's kind of like Will was saying, like it's not gonna kill you um, if your business flops. I always say that if my business really flops and I, I kind of lose everything, I'll take my kids, um, which I was told I wouldn't have, speaking of, by the way, because of all of the scar tissues and things like that. Um, I have two children, 10 and 7. And I could just take them. We'll live on a little boat in Alaska, and we'll be OK. And if it goes like wildly successful and I'm a multi-billionaire, we're going to move to Alaska and live on a bigger boat. And <laughs> We're going to be OK. And I think there's something to the idea of keeping your like, best and worst case scenarios very close. <laughs> then that whole sense of taking risks. And it's not to say I don't get scared. Like My favorite expression usually is like, well, wash my tums down with an elka seltzer, because this is fucking stressful. And I'm up at 3 in the morning, and the ceiling is bleeding. And um, you know, I mean, all of us do it. I, actually, I always call tums entrepreneur candy. Like every entrepreneur I know has like Costco Tums somewhere, <laughs> like within a reach, arm's reach of them, right? Yeah. Um, so there's that idea of borrowed time, and this idea of limits. And I was trying to think of my audience for today and what they actually have in common, because it's we keep throwing out words like innovators and creatives and. But it's a really, really diverse group of people and a really fascinating group of people. And so I wanted to find something that worked. And what I think this group of people really has in common is this idea, maybe not of limits, but this idea of unlimited. This idea of whatever it is that you do, like there's workarounds to any of those obstacles. And there's something, and I'm excited to hear um, Tim talk next, because <laughs> it's going to be so amazing. Um, but this idea of how do we actually teach, and how do we teach that? How do we teach this thing that we have in common of being able to see those, those obstacles as opportunities and that lack of limits for whatever it is we do? Um, and so I want to sort of talk about that in our white space, but I also want to kind of challenge this group of people to not become sort of, like it's really neat that we come together and that it's curated, but I don't want to limit the other people. I don't want to sort of have this us with this unlimited idea and them that don't have it. Because I think you give a kid from Hamilton a camera you might do a lot. You, um, you give a kid from elsewhere an opportunity that they might make a modern major media. You just don't know. So I, I challenge you to, to look at your own biases around how great you are. I think all of us, our very best qualities are worst. And if you really dig into yourself, you'll see that. And maybe that's a good conversation for next year. Instead of the questions, we all have to get up and say what our one quality is that's our best and worst quality, because I, I really believe it's the same one. So anyhow, we'll move on to white space, out of elsewhere and into our white space. 
Um, I did bring magazines, if anyone wants them. You have to, you know, they're the print product, so work around the Missoula ads. But I brought my favorite issue. Um, it's the letting go issue. So on that note, let's let go into our white space and go from there. And I understand if you're all really sleepy, as am I, um, from changing what I thought I was going to talk about to what I'm talking about, about like 1 in the morning. Um, so the questions can be more sort of discussion if you just have something you want to say. It doesn't have to be a specific question to me either. You talked about how your early experiences shaped you, you know, and that you're on borrowed time and that yeah. that really kind of brought you to this limitless thinking and we're in this room full of people and many of us are parents and we've talked about this mm -hmm. and you <laughs> talk to lots of moms and we're raising our kids and you don't put those things, we don't put those things in their lives. We're not making our children poor so that they grow up the way that we did, yeah. right? <laughs> That's, I'm, I'm, I know, I'm hoping that I'm actually raising like ungrateful little shits because <laughs> right. I, I think yeah, that would exactly. be... <laughs> Like, that's my greatest wish for them. I, yeah, um. I, well, it, well, is it, though, right? Because, I mean, I'm who I am because I grew up poor and, you know, and, and was sick yeah. at 16. And so, so when you say, how do we teach this, what is the discussion that's happening around that? And even a discussion in here, you know, can you teach it? I think you can. I think you can because I don't think it all comes from hardship. That's just sort of my story. I think that it comes from somebody, and maybe it's all of these people in this room, saying to you anything's possible and showing that you do it every day, but actually sharing it and not like in a sort of jerk way where you're like, look what I do. I, w I bet you wish you could do it, you know, but like um, in this way of like really like I'm not wildly special. I just have found workarounds and you can do that too. I don't know. Tim is going to tell us, actually. <laughs> <laughs> How we teach that. But I, I think that a lot of it is just that, maybe just that recognition of that, that we all do that and that not everyone does and that that, that is an actually really probably, maybe it's not such a hard question. Maybe it's a really easy thing to teach. Maybe it's an easy thing to say, you can do anything. Maybe your school totally sucks, child of mine. Bring something special to it. That makes your school special. My poor children. I just called them ungrateful shit. Um, I wanted to ask, because this is a, a, like visually, it's really powerful and the, the, the topic's you. fantastic. So where do you, how much of this sort of comes out of you personally as opposed to your team and what, where, does, where does the inspiration and the vision come from each, ep each edition? Um, I probably do the vision, but I actually try not to uh, write that often. This, actually, this issue actually has a little more of me in it, and that's part of why we bring it to events. Um, I don't want to be Oprah or, or Martha Stewart. I, I want to build something I can sell. And if it's too much about me, I can't do that. We actually don't have any staff writers and very specifically on purpose. And we kind of live in this time where everyone's generating content, right? And we just curate the best of our readers' content. And that allows us to, and that's been a huge part of why we've grown. We haven't tried to be where we are. Right now, we're trying to catch up to where we've landed, which is bigger and brighter and more than we expected. But it wasn't like I set out and I was like, now how are we going to get people in? Australia to read us. Um, it happened because people resonated the content and they said, I could tell my story. And so we started having these people with big platforms go, I have a story. And, and I think we wouldn't have had that had we had this sort of slick lingo filled magazine. The other thing that I think, it's almost embarrassing that this sets us apart from other women's publications is that we don't ever do any, any how-to articles. And it's like the simplest thing in the world, but apparently it's a radical idea. Um, we just let people tell their stories, and we help them tell them really, really well. And 
design it. The, the bloggers love it because they hit publish every day, and even if millions of people read it, I think that there's a little bit of insecurity about just hitting publish for yourself instead of going through a process and being edited and vetted. And, um, Do you pay them? I've always paid all of my writers and photographers. Um, it was a little bit easier when I was a free local publication because my writers and photographers didn't expect very much. Um, but the, the idea, even as a free local publication, was to put something out there that didn't look like a free local publication. We actually have a surprising number of readers who aren't moms. I think it's just sort of this universal desire to read somebody's first person story that's done well. Um, we're distributed at the airport. I don't know if Scott's here, but at the Liquid Planet in Missoula. And I think that's been a big part of it too, is it's us or Sky Mall. Like out, going out of Missoula, <laughs> that's it. So we get these like letters and it, it, we get an amazing amount of feedback um, too, which I think is interesting. We get letters from like middle-aged businessmen with no children who read us on the way to Minneapolis and they cried and they laughed and they're going to send it to their partner in their firm's daughter who has kids. Um, but I just, I do think that there is something, even though our product is for a specific group of people and in part that's because of the business of it and who wants to have these women who buy all of the stuff know about them. But I think our content does sort of transcend. We also always have an article by a dad and a, a poem by a kid that ends the, each issue of what they think moms should know, which are pretty spectacular. Um, and we've had a lot of writers who don't have children that just sort of talk about maybe why they don't or, or how, you know, how that sort of came to be. It's just that sort of the anchor of the context. Um, we use Submittable, as I've said, but we have enough content that we could stop accepting submissions now and probably put out five more years worth of great stuff. Um, there, and that's a big part of stepping into this national space in the iPad. We're, really, we're quarterly with our print product because that's all the local advertising can sustain. As we sort of move beyond that, there's, there, people have a lot to say. And then it's really more a, a gauge of what readers can absorb at a time, like we did with our website, where we went from putting everything on our website to now we actually don't put our print magazine's content on our website. Unless it's like somebody super famous and we want it searchable, but we don't put it on our main page of our website. Someone could search it. Our website has something unique to it every day and just the one thing to bring everybody kind of to that one common place. Yeah, oh. Hi, yes, Steve. okay. Uh, I, I can relate to when you said getting sick when you were young. Mm -hmm. Well, I got injured when I was real young and I, it's not easy no. to grow up like this. And I think I want to know what, or oh, no, I can tell each and every one of you that it's not easy to do it. Uh-uh. Thank you. Thank you. You're w very much welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think to that point, everyone's got their thing. You know, and maybe if we kind of wore our thing on the outside a little more. It's not a, not a bad example. So thank you very much. And you're very much welcome, too. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I'd love to hear you talk uh, just a little bit about what it was like to do something like this and be a mom. Oh, that's a good question. I actually, I always have people after I talk come up and say, do you ever see your kids? Um, <laughs> yes, I do. Um, they're spectacular little people. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I really, my business has grown as they have. I actually was still very sick when I had my kids. Um, so we kind of, like, my kids know every public restroom in Missoula so intimately. It's, I'm like, don't touch anything. Um, but 
so what, what I was actually capable of has also changed as I've gotten better in some ways um, and as my kids have grown. I have, I don't really believe in luck. I think we all work too hard for that word. But I have um, a really great husband. I have a great family. My mom actually lives with us right now. I figured if Barack Obama is going to move his like mother-in-law in to like, pull off his day, I can do it too. Um, <laughs> my husband also owns a, his own small business. So it's a little bit of a shit show at our house. I mean, every day we're like, bye kids, have a good day at school. And then we're all like, who's going to pick him up? I can't. You have to. No. <laughs> Call Grammy. Um, so, so there is a little bit of that. It's a juggle, for sure, to, I mean, it's a juggle to be here. Like, I'm not with my kids today. That sort of sucks, but it also doesn't. Sometimes it sucks to be home with my kids. I mean, <laughs> and you have to continually kind of pan in and out of that. I think that it helps that I've created a brand that really lends itself very well to the life I want. Like when I, I take my kids actually back up to Alaska, I take them elsewhere. Um, for almost a month every summer, my husband travels a ton in the summer and so it's the boys and I and I'm trying to work and it's crazy and um, I, I, I always put in my bio and people think I'm joking that the best thing I've learned doing mama load is the ability to work in chaos, but I'm not joking. Like I can, I can like step over the mountains of laundry and like move all of the like go gurt wrappers off my computer and just sit down and there's Legos pinging off my head and, um, and just work because that's how I can work. It's not like ideal, but it's better than not doing it. Um, there's also a secret too with kids, like once they hit a certain age, the best way to get any work done is invite like 10 other kids over. It's very counterintuitive, but it's true. You reach this critical mass and they don't care that you're there. Like, every hour you stop and you throw food and some Band-Aids and then you go back to work. And I mean, I can get, I can get like an eight-hour day's worth of work in the summer just by filling my house with small boys. Um, so I think it's, for me, it's really a, I was a really bad stay-at-home mom, in part because I felt like crap. But I think I would have been bad anyway because I kind of, my husband would walk in the door when my kids were really little and they didn't, we didn't have this like exchange of communication. We just sort of had this exchange of like effort. Um, and not in a bad way, but it's just a lot of work and it's a lot of work for them. They can't tell you what they want any more than you can tell them what you want. It's hard. Um, my husband would walk in the door and I'd be like, so, blah, 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 blah. I have so much to tell you. I was on the internet and I was thinking that we should do this and he actually always says that when I die, he's going to get a gravestone that says, so, I have an idea. And <laughs> um, best, best and worst quality right there. I'm, I'm telling you mine. Too many ideas. Um, I wasn't very good at staying home. And I've been actually, I, everyone has their own thing. This isn't like a justification or this is how you should do it. Um, but I, I'm a much better mom when I'm excited about something else. Um, then I'm ready for a break from that part of my brain when I'm with my kids and we can be in their space, in their world, a little bit more than mine. And they're good sports about being in mine sometimes, and sometimes they're not. But there's a point at which I think that with mom we don't do how to, and we, so I have to sort of be careful of espaging my beliefs about parenting. But I think in the context of Hatch, I think there's a point at which, and I think, San, San, you sort of touched on this. You have to sort of try and figure out what's best for your family. And that's more than the little people in the house. So there you go. Are we all set? Any other questions, or are we good? Oh, Liz has a question. Uh -oh. Uh, oh, 
Go back and Google Elkie and read the article she wrote about sex with her husband. That was in Real Simple. It's fabulous. And every man in Missoula. Uh, actually, it's an article about lack of sex with my husband. Um, That's what I mean. Yeah, you I took one away. for the team right there, women. Um, <laughs> I, I still meet people, especially in and around Missoula. I'll meet men, and they're like, oh, you're Elkie. My wife sent me your article. <laughs> and I'm always like, oh, which article is that? I've written lots of articles about lots of really important things to me. And they're like, mm. and I'm like, I know. I know which one you're talking about. It's the where, oh, where did my mojo go? Um, which actually, yeah, did get picked up. Somebody from Real Simple read it. And then they flew my husband and I out to New York. And we got to. Um, we got to have sex in New York. Um, <laughs> and somebody paid us. <laughs> it's the most amazing feeling. Um, so like I said, it's OK to get paid for doing what you love. There you go. Is that my final thing I'm going to say? <laughs> oh, no. There, that's what you can all remember me for. Well, thanks, Elke. Thank you.